Okay, so I just want to show you a little bit around how uh, we might assess the sacroiliac joint mobility. Um, and I've shown that already on a person, but if we have a look from this model point of view, this is kind of what we're looking for both in this assessment, and we might notice it also when they're walking. So obviously when we walk, um, there is a degree of movement in the sacroiliac joint. Um, anatomists will put that at about two millimeters or something like that, so it's not a huge amount, but it looks a lot more when you see it in action. So basically you have this movement here at the sacroiliac joint on both sides, and the, and the sacrum is doing something like this as you walk. So that movement is pretty important. Now, what you might see when people walk, and supposing they had a left-sided sacroiliac restriction here, so in other words, this is not moving, that when they walk, instead of this kind of action where the iliac crest here, or the hips, if you want to call them that, are fairly level with the ground, so they're not moving too much up and down and front and back, fairly level, um, you get this kind of movement. But if it's restricted, then instead of that kind of movement, what you tend to see is as they lift their leg, the ilium will rise as well. So you get this rising up, coming forward, and then with the heel strike, you get a kind of a jarring action, which you might well see through the iliac crest as well. So instead of a free movement here, you're getting this rising up, coming forward and down, and as the heel strike, that puts a little bit of a jarring through the iliac crest as well, which you might see. Partly because the sacroiliac joints actually act as a bit of a shock absorber. So the stalk test is a very good way and simple way of assessing sacroiliac joint problems, um, and particularly any kind of restriction around either side. And it's pretty straightforward. What we're doing really is assessing from the point of view of the movement between here, the sacrum, and the ilia, the left ilia, and the right ilia, ilium rather. So for this test, what we're doing is we'll place one thumb uh, on the sacrum somewhere. It doesn't really matter. You know, the top of your gluteal crease is somewhere around there. So as long as we're above that. And the other hand will be on fingers on the left ilium here and thumb towards the PSIS, sort of back of the iliac crest there. And what we would do is ask them to raise their leg. So if I was testing the left side, what you will see is the movement of the ilium like this. So your, your hand will come up and your thumb will drop down as they raise their knee up to beyond 90 degrees. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Now, of course, if there was restriction here, what you'll see instead is something like this. As they raise up, it'll go up with it because it can't move here, so it goes up with it. And you'll see it then that you'll feel this movement upwards with your thumb rather than downwards. So we can assess one side and then go to the other side and assess the other. So the thumb there acts as a kind of reference. You've got your fingers on the iliac crest and the thumb back on the PSIS and you ask them to do the same thing. Always a good idea, obviously, to support them with a chair so they don't fall over. But the other thing you will notice is that where there's a restricted side, they'll often feel that it's kind of unstable. As they do that, they kind of like judder a bit and look like they're going to fall over. So just be careful that they don't do that. So for the Bowen sacral work, which is really, really effective, this is something that Bowen developed for use in pregnancy, actually. Um, because during pregnancy, all these ligaments around the sacroiliac joint become quite loose um, because the sacrum needs to open, the whole pelvis needs to open um, towards the end of pregnancy and particularly in childbirth. Um, so he used to say actually that you could do this at any time and, and really it provides pretty much instantaneous relief for a lot of people with lower back pain or sciatic type problems. And but it's particularly good for sacroiliac joint restriction. So just to position uh, the moves here, what we're going to do, we will have done the um, bottom stoppers first, and you could even do those as they're standing up. So that's their moves over the left erector spinae muscle and the right erector spinae muscle around the level of L4. And then if we come down to the base of the sacrum, so this is the inferior angle here of the sacrum. This is the coccyx and you have some really, really strong ligaments which come off from here to the sitting bone there. 
And uh, those ligaments are really some of the strongest in the body. They can take several thousand kilos of strain. So this move can be fairly firm. And of course, from there, the, that's continuous uh, with the hamstrings and what Tom Myers refers to as the whole superficial back line. So this also uh, will tend to affect the ligaments that come up here and attach onto the iliac crest and are continuous with the whole thoracolumbar fascia. So that's why it's also very, very good for lower back pain and lumbar pain. So the first move, as I said, is quite strong. And we would start just beneath the inferior angle of the sacrum here. We would take the skin slag up onto the bone and with their exhalation, we're falling off that onto that very strong sacred tuberous ligament. So that's that first move, coming up onto the bone, asking them to breathe and falling off down. Then we wait for a little bit, and then we want to put the thumb back on, and the idea of that is acting as a holding point. And as I explained before, holding points in bone really help to contain the work. So what we're trying to do now with this second move is contain the work within the sacroiliac joint area. So by doing this, putting this back as a holding point, when we do this second move here, we're going over the edge of the gluteus medius and minimus. And as we do that, we send an impulse very strongly into the sacroiliac area, in particular the ligaments that hold the sacroiliac joint in relationship. So normally with this kind of procedure, we would start on the least affected side, so the less painful side or the less restricted side, um, and then move to the other side. And really, if uh, neither side are particularly affected, we start on the left. So having done this side first, I would go to the right side and do the same thing.